Peace be with you all, Cosmic Ships, written by Samael on Veor. Part 1. Chapter 1. Concerns for the World. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are going to speak about some very interesting subjects of living reality. Obviously, we are in times of extraordinary concerns for the world. Thus, it is necessary, if it is what we want, to deeply reflect on them at this present moment in which we live. It appears that we have a powerful modern civilization, since many advances have been made in the fields of physics, chemistry, medicine, engineering, etc. In this, our great civilization, we have built powerful ships and directed them towards the moon. Ships have scanned space, and have landed on the lunar surface, etc. Ships have also been sent to Venus, although they were not manned. Excursions to Mars are planned, and it has been said that around the year 1985, or maybe later, the United States is planning to send a manned nuclear rocket to Mars. We will wait for concrete results on this particular subject matter. All of this is intriguing and extraordinary in its depth. Television has fulfilled a great mission, since thanks to the television we perfectly followed the progress of the rockets that descended upon the moon. Much about lunar life was learned, and this was abundantly investigated. Many wise men previously thought that the moon was a piece of Earth projected into outer space, yet the carbon-14 tests were definitive, Earthlings arrived at the logical conclusion that the moon existed before the Earth. The moon is older than the Earth, and this by itself is sensational. All those wise men that in the past maintained the theory that the moon was a piece of the Earth projected into outer space were lamentably mistaken. I repeat, tests and rigorous analysis of the lunar rocks by means of carbon-14 indicated to Earthlings that those wise men who in the past maintained the thesis that the moon was a piece of the Earth were mistaken. Therefore, we are in times of great scientific concerns for the world. We must reflect deeply upon all of these things, at least for a while. You are here because you have scientific concerns for the world, and I am here because I also have great scientific concerns for the world. You have come willingly to listen to me, and I am prepared to converse with you, thus, between us there must be an exchange of ideas. Indeed, we have all met together in order to study many things, in order to analyze diverse important subjects that are interesting to you and me. Thus, I want all of us, all together, to analyze these subjects of living reality. Obviously, we Earthlings struggle for the conquest of space, and we are sincerely doing it. Our scientists fly upon the wings of their projects towards a future in which the Earthlings definitively conquer other worlds. Nevertheless, we must not in any way become fascinated with so many sophisms. Instead, it is convenient that we, by our own means, investigate for ourselves. In this way, we will probably avoid many disappointments. You know that in these times, much has been spoken about the subject of cosmic ships coming from other planets. There is a type of antinomy, a very interesting antithesis between rockets launched by Tyrians and Trojans to the Moon or Venus, and cosmic ships originated from other planets. Among the Tyrians and Trojans there is a certain skepticism that leads to nowhere. There are therefore concerns on one side, and on the other antagonistic concepts, clashing opinions, to reflect upon all of this is praiseworthy. When we hear about flying saucers, we may pay attention or we just smile a little, skeptically, but listen, there is something real in all of this, since it does not seem to me, in any way, that our planet Earth is the only inhabited planet. When one studies the panspermia of Arrhenius, one discovers with mystical astonishment that the seed germs of life come from other planets. Thus, the theories of Arrhenius are intriguing. Obviously, within the luminiferous dust of stars, our planet Earth is an inhabited world, a world that rotates around the sun, a planet like any other in the infinite space. The law of philosophical analogies invites us to think that if our planet Earth is inhabited, then there also must be other inhabited planets within the infinite space. I will never think that the seed germs of universal life are an exclusive patrimony of the planet Earth. It seems to me that exclusivism in this sense is regressive, reactionary, retarded. I invite you to think, if we are fighting for the conquest of space, it is then possible that this same fight also exists on other planets. 
Therefore, I will never discard the idea of the possibility of extraterrestrial people, inhabitants of other spheres, who have already conquered outer space. To think that we are the only ones in such a huge space, made up of millions and millions of planets, is too reactionary and snobbish. Remember that in the times of Columbus, many were those who laughed at that wise man, that great navigator, when he hurled, as they said then, through the ocean, beyond Cape Finisterre. Then, in the time of Columbus, there was the belief that the earth was flat, square, thus nobody in Europe accepted the possibility of life beyond Cape Finisterre, which in Latin means where the earth, terra, ends, finis. It appears that sometimes there are those who think with a medieval mind, denying the possibility of conscious and intelligent life on other planets. Indubitably, they think with an old-fashioned, anti-revolutionary, medieval criterion. Let us admit the possibility of life on other planets. The cosmic ships are a reality. People more cultured than us exist on other inhabited planets. They already conquered outer space, and about this I can give you a convincing testimony. If I were to base myself on mere intellectual lucubrations, then indeed I would not have a basis to affirm the thesis of other planets inhabited by extraterrestrial people. If I were to base myself solely on purely intellectual conceptions of formal logic or dialectic reasoning in order to emphasize the idea of the possibility of the existence of extraterrestrial people, then I would be just another theoretician. Yet, truly, the existence of extraterrestrial beings is a fact for me. I know them personally, in flesh and bone, and for that reason I do not have any inconvenience in giving testimony about them. If you believe it, good. If you accept it, wonderful. If you reject it, that is your business. In any case, I will give my testimony. One day, it does not matter which, when residing in Mexico City, I had to visit El Desierto de los Leones, the desert of the Lions National Park. I wanted to peacefully abide there, even if only for a few hours. I wanted to deliver myself to the calmest of reflections. All of a sudden, I felt myself attracted towards a certain place in the forest. I saw a space there, in the woods. I do not know why I had the feeling of directing myself towards that place, even when indeed I found an enormous cosmic ship standing upon a steel tripod. Obviously, I confess to you that I felt completely confused, moved, that discovery left me absolutely astounded. However the story does not end here, a metallic hatch opened, and I saw the chief or captain descend from that ship, the crew came behind him. Naturally, I addressed the chief, the captain, I saluted him, and he answered my greeting in perfect Spanish. Good morning, I said to him. Good morning, answered the captain. Amongst the crew I saw two elderly ladies. What age could they be? I do not know. Unquestionably, their ages would have to correspond to other times, not to our earthly time. I spoke to the captain, saying, Sir, I would like to know the planet Mars, since my own spiritual, divine, sparkling sea germ relates to that planet of the infinite space. My monad, we would say, speaking in the style of Leibniz, who occupied himself so much with the monads. After some minutes, the captain in charge of that ship took the floor and said, To Mars is what you said? Yes, I would like to know the planet Mars, and I would like you to take me there. I am willing to go with you now, immediately, nothing can hold me on the planet Earth. To Mars, said the captain to me, such a planet is just there, indeed, that world is very nearby. Thus, when speaking in this manner, I comprehended that my request, or that my pretension had been too poor. I believed I had requested something very great, but so, why lie? My request had been indeed very poor. By certain intuitive signs, they made me understand that the ship that seemed so splendid to me came down from a mother ship that was hidden, orbiting the Earth. Our solar system, well known with the name Solar System of Ors, was not in any way unknown to the captain, yet it was but one of so many solar systems of the unalterable infinite. Undoubtedly, I found myself before intergalactic travelers, people who travel from galaxy to galaxy, wise and cognizant individuals. I am a writer, I said to him, and I would like to be taken to other inhabited planets, 
in order to write and give convincing testimony to this humanity about the existence of other inhabited planets. I am a man, I said to him, I am not a simple intellectual animal. The request that I make of you is not for me, but for this humanity in general. I would like in some way to contribute to the general culture of this world on which I live. In short, I set out many concepts, nevertheless, that captain kept silent. I even held on to that tripod of steel, with the purpose of not letting go of it until they agreed to put me inside the ship and take off with me. But everything was useless, they kept silent. I examined that man and all the crew, they were personages of a copper color, ample forehead, thin body, stature of about 1 meter with 20 and 30 or 40 centimeters, 3.8 to 4.4 feet at the most. The crew finally sat down on some wood trunks that were in the forest. The ladies were two venerable elders, and I could not do less than to observe such strange creatures. I could not see in them our terrestrial perversity. I carefully noticed the sense of human responsibility that they had. They spoke little, because they have a very high concept of the word. They do not speak on a whim like us, they speak little and say much. For them, the word is gold, powdered gold. They only use it in very indispensable cases. I did not see the face of assassins on them, like ours, the earthlings, neither did I see that Machiavellian look on them, with which so many particular films are adorned. In those strange creatures only shown wisdom, love, and power. They are humans, but true humans, in the most complete sense of the word. None of them wanted to abduct me. On the contrary, I fought too much, requesting from them that they take me. I am sure that if they had granted such a request to me, in no way would they have made me a guinea pig for their laboratory. We earthlings are another thing. If by any chance we managed to catch an extraterrestrial, it is certain that he would immediately go to the laboratory, and as far as the ship, we would confiscate it, and with it, like a pattern, we would be able to build many other ships in order to bomb defenseless cities, in order to conquer other worlds by force, and make devilish things and more, because we earthlings, beginning with me, are truly terribly perverse. That is the crude reality of the facts. In no way I have come here in order to wash my hands in front of you, and to say that I am a meek sheep, no. All of us here are cut with the same scissors, thus the defects that I have, you have them also, and vice versa. Therefore, I assure you that the testimony that I give about those people is sincere, truly sincere. I am not trying in any way to deform the testimony, to deform the truth. Finally, from those of the crew who were seated upon the wood trunks there, one of the ladies stood up, and in the name of all the crew she took the floor and said, if we place a plant that is not aromatic next to another that is aromatic, the one that is not aromatic would be impregnated with the aroma of the one that is aromatic. Soon she continued, the same happens on inhabited planets. Worlds that previously advanced poorly, with perverse humanities, were little by little transformed by the aroma, the vibration, of neighboring planets. But, as you see, we just arrived here at this planet Earth, and we do not see that the same happens here. What is happening on this planet? Well, the question that they asked me was tremendous, and I had to give an answer, then, of high quality. Thus, without reflecting that much, but of course taking care of the word very well, I said, this planet Earth is a mistake of the gods. But soon I completed it, clarifying the concept as best I could, and said, this is how the karma of the worlds is. Karma is a word that represents or means cause and effect, by such a cause, such an effect. The earth has causes that brought it into existence, and if within those causes are mistakes, more or less, the effects will have the outcome of those mistakes. Thus, when saying, this is how the karma of the worlds is, with great astonishment I saw that the elderly lady who had spoken agreed, inclining her head with one respectful bow. She did not say anything, but simply agreed. The other elderly lady did the same, she made one respectful bow, and all of the crew, in moderate genuflection, agreed. Well, I will say something to you, I thought that they were going to pull me by my ears, because it was terrible for a poor devil like me to give an answer to people who travel from galaxy to galaxy, but I did it. I did it, my answer worked, and that cheered me. 
Of course, I resolved to take the best advantage of such ascent. Thus, I said to myself, well, this is the moment, thus, I returned to reiterate my request to be taken to another planet of the infinite space, in order to give testimony to the people about the reality of other inhabited planets. I am writer, I said to them. And it is not for me, it is for this humanity, take me. To no avail. My requests were worthless. The silence was terrible. Finally, the captain pronounced a phrase, nothing but that, because they speak little and they say much. They never utter the word if they are not going to fulfill it. They are not like us, i.e. we tend to say to a friend, tomorrow we will meet in the morning at nine in the cafe so that we can converse about the business, and the friend does not arrive, and if he arrives, he appears around 10, or 11, or 12. So, those people speak little and say much. It seems as if those personages were truly gods with human bodies, they gave me that impression when conversing with them. Thus, I obtained an answer, and as soon as they gave it to me, it is clear that I was satisfied, along the way, said the captain, we will see. Nothing more, that was the only thing that he said to me, but that for me was definitive. If an earthling had said the same to me, I would simply have considered those words like an escape, like an evasion, for example as when one asks a job, and they say to you, we will consider you when there is a vacancy. When receiving such an earthling answer, one feels like leaving, running 500 kilometers per hour, since we can be sure that we have failed in the request. Yet, I was not conversing with earthlings, but extraterrestrials. Along the way, we will see. Which way was that captain talking about? The esoteric path of initiation, the path that I am following, and that many are following, the path that leads to the Superman, that straight, narrow, and difficult path of which the Christ speaks, that mysterious path tread by Dante, Hermes Trismegistus, or Jesus of Nazareth. I follow such a path, therefore, the words of that captain filled me with strength. Well, he gave me his hand, his right hand, then he boarded the ship by a stairway. Also, those of the crew boarded. I comprehended that I should withdraw, thus, I did so. I did not want in any way that my body be instantaneously disintegrated by the force of that ship. Thus, I withdrew a certain distance so that I could observe, through the trees, the moment in which the ship took off. It raised slowly, until a certain point, and soon it hurried through the infinite space, without making any type of noise. I assure you that I am giving a testimony about people who already conquered space, about the extraterrestrials. I have come here to tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. I have not come to give false testimonies, because with that I would not gain anything, nor would you gain anything. I would deceive myself and I would commit the absurd crime of deceiving my fellow men. I am giving you a testimony of the truth, of what concerns me about the extraterrestrials. If you believe me, wonderful, if you do not believe me, it does not matter to me. If you laugh, well, that is your business, yet in any case, Victor Hugo in one of his works stated, the one who laughs at what he does not know is an ignoramus who walks on the path of idiocy. So, I give my testimony, the rest is up to you. Yes, there exist other people who already conquered outer space, and who are not earthlings. They are people who come from other densely populated planets. It is urgent to comprehend that those people, who already conquered the infinite space, do not have vices. They do not drink, they do not smoke, they do not fornicate, they do not adulterate, they do not rob, they do not kill. They are perfect, in the most complete sense of the word. Thus, I say to myself and to you, thinking aloud now, have we, earthlings, such merits? Are we worthy to conquer infinite space? And if we could attain it, what would be our conduct on other inhabited worlds? Are we sure that we are not going to go and drink there, to get drunk, to adulterate, etc.? Are we so perfect that we believe we are capable of conquering infinite space? Now then, I understand that those cosmic ships are multidimensional. It seems to me that the three dimensions, length, width, and height, are not everything. Euclid's three-dimensional geometry has been abundantly discussed. I.e. this table has length, width, and height, it has three dimensions, but there must be a fourth vertical in this table. What would it be? 
I say that this is time. How long has it been since this table was fabricated? Behold the fourth vertical there. Indubitably, the fifth coordinate also exists. I understand that it is eternity. And beyond the fifth dimension, there must exist the sixth, that is to say, a dimension that is not time, neither eternity, nor the three-dimensional world. The fifth coordinate is eternity, the fourth is time, but what would the sixth be, and the seventh? The sixth is beyond eternity and time, yet, as far as the seventh, it is the dimension zero, unknowable, pure spirit, we would say. Indubitably, there must be seven basic, fundamental dimensions. However, while we base our existence on the three-dimensional dogma of Euclid, we will remain in a regressive, retarded state. At the present time, modern physics is retarded, regressive, antiquated, old-fashioned, because it is exclusively based on the three fundamental basic dimensions of Euclid's three-dimensional dogma. Extraterrestrial ships are based on a different geometry. I say that a tetradimensional geometry must be created, this would be possible if we more thoroughly investigate the atom. Obviously, it is in the atom where the fourth vertical is drawn up. The day in which we can draw up the fourth vertical on paper, we will be capable then to also create a tetradimensional geometry. With a geometry like that, we could then build ships of four dimensions, ships able to travel in time, now to a remote past, now to a remote future. With ships like that, we could conquer the infinite space. Regrettably, we cannot create those types of ships yet. In order to travel to Mars in a nuclear rocket, we will take about two years, and according to the explanations of those extraterrestrials that I met in El Desierto de los Leones I understood that unless, in a matter of minutes, they are on Mars, for the Mars is just there, at the corner store, so to speak, and it is because they put their ships within the fourth vertical. Their ships are propelled by solar energy, and this is wonderful. Nevertheless, we Earthlings needed to send rockets equipped with liquid fuel, and our astronauts performed 50,000 acrobatics in order to land on the moon. However, extraterrestrials do not need such acrobatics, since for them the moon is just there. Therefore, I do not see why we have to feel so proud of our so boasted modern civilization. I invite you to comprehend that we Earthlings are nothing but embryos, and that our so boasted modern civilization is not really that worthy. I invite you to thoroughly comprehend this subject of the conquest of interplanetary space. It is necessary to analyze, it is necessary to study. It is necessary to comprehend that if we want the conquest of infinite space, we must begin to study ourselves, because the laws of the cosmos are within us, ourselves, here and now. If we do not discover the laws of the cosmos within us, we will never discover them outside of us. The human being is contained within nature, and nature is contained within the human being. Therefore, if we want to conquer infinite space, we must begin to conquer ourselves. At the present time, we are victims of circumstances. We have not learned how to handle the diverse circumstances of life. We still do not know how to determine circumstances. We are toys of all the forces of the universe. We live in a convulsing world, a world that is going to pass through great catastrophes. Earthquakes are coming. They have been walking across America from south to north. One day, Chile is affected by great earthquakes and tidal waves, later Caracas, followed by Colombia. Nicaragua was shaken, followed by Honduras, and in Guatemala, earthquakes just happened. It is necessary to know that soon all of our cities in Mexico will be shaken by earthquakes. San Francisco, California is called to disappear. There is a fault at the foot of the California Peninsula that has already been studied. It is a deep crack that has already begun to devour California little by little. Obviously, California will sink to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. We live, then, in a world that is threatened by great convulsions, and the psychological state in which we are, and that of our civilization, etc., deserves to be reflected upon by us a little. The bottoms of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans are full of deep cracks. In the Pacific, mainly, there are some cracks that are so deep that they already put the fire in contact with the water. The water of the ocean penetrates within the interior of the earth in those zones where the liquid fire exists, 
Thus this is forming pressure and steam that increase from moment to moment. The pressure and steam are originating earthquakes on a great scale, and all of you, distinguished gentlemen and ladies, are going to be convinced within a short time that there will be not a single place on the planet Earth where one can be safe. The earthquakes and tidal waves must intensify due to pressures and underground steam. The ice of the North Pole is melting, and because icebergs float, they drift with water currents towards the equator into warmer water. Hot currents of water are being produced at the South Pole. These currents are exiting through some craters. These hot water currents penetrate certain places of Guinea. There are changes within the planet Earth, and if the pressures and steam continue, one day the terrestrial crust will erupt. There is no doubt that at the present time, any cosmic event, i.e. the arrival of some gigantic world, would be enough to produce such an explosion. We are seated over a powder barrel, and we do not realize it. The Earth in its entirety is being prepared for formidable geologic changes. Thus, nature at the moment is passing through difficult processes. Nature is experiencing a great agony. The fire of the interior of the Earth is uneasy. Sadly, we, on the epidermis of this planet, believe we are very safe. We are raising powerful buildings, as if they will never fall to the ground. We build powerful ships, as if they will allow us to flee to other planets at any given moment. Yes, we feel like masters of the universe, yet regrettably, any stomachache is enough to put us in bed. Yes, we are weak, yet we believe ourselves to be invincible. It seems to me that we must reflect upon what we are, upon what is happening, upon what is happening at this moment. Two frightful world wars have occurred in this 20th century, the World War from 1914 to 1918, and the World War from 1939 to 1945. And, there will be a third world war, and it will be atomic. Then, there will be a great holocaust, powerful cities will be reduced to ashes. Millions of people will perish. The gravest of all of this is that the abuse of atomic physics will take us to disaster. A day will arrive on which the decomposition of the atom chain will occur, and then the scientists will not be able to control the atomic energy. There is no doubt that the radioactive contamination will be frightful, i.e. clouds loaded with radioactivity will pour over the harvests, contaminating them. Therefore, during the Third World War we will no longer have the necessary food to eat, because the radioactivity will have contaminated the harvests completely. The contaminated food will be worthless for our nourishment. At the rate that we are going, we should not feel very safe with a civilization that staggers, and we should not feel very safe with our theories, concepts, or ideas either. It is worth the trouble for us to review everything we have learned in school, college, university, in books written by different writers. I am not trying to attack any theory, no. I am only inviting all of you to reflection, and nothing else, this is the only goal of this lecture. There is a law known as the law of universal entropy. If we take two full water kettles, one containing hot water and the other containing cold water, and we place them together, we will see in them a devolving disorder. Behold here, universal entropy. If people do not work upon themselves, if they do not try to pass through a type of psychological revolution, if they do not modify their customs, their way of life and way of being, then they will march in accordance with the law of entropy. They will devolve over time, and a day will arrive in which there will be no difference between person and person. All of us will become terribly perverse. As far as the planet Earth is concerned, we cannot deny that it is subject to the law of entropy. The atmosphere is completely contaminated, the seas have become enormous garbage containers, and many marine species are disappearing. Fish have died in the rivers. To find a river that is not contaminated is already difficult. The fruits of the earth have been adulterated with grafting upon grafting. Now, it is difficult to eat a legitimate apple. Now we must eat grafted apples. All of this has altered the order of the universe, the order of nature. Thus, there are soils that no longer produce. At the moment, the globe has 4,500 million people and the food supply will not be of sufficient quantity to maintain so many people. 
In the coming years, there will be millions of people who will die of hunger. Even at this moment, there are plenty of people who are perishing because of hunger. Therefore, the earth as a whole is perishing. It is progressing according to the law of universal entropy. The fields that once were cultivable, that bore fruits in abundance in order to maintain everybody, are now sterile. The experiments made with atomic energy and those chemical fertilizers have sterilized the fields. Everything moves in a devolving way. At these moments, the earth is in agony, and what is worse is that it is in agony and we do not realize that it is in agony. Obviously, if a person is in agony, we already know what will happen to him. Similarly, if our planet Earth is in agony, we must understand what will happen to it. A day will come in which the Earth will become equalized everywhere, turned into a gigantic Sahara, or better said, turned into another moon of the infinite space. Nevertheless, the wisdom of the creative demiurge of the universe is magnificent. It is not irrelevant to emphatically tell you that transformation is only possible by means of sacrifice. I.e. if we did not sacrifice the coal in the steam engine, we would not have the steam power to move the train. Similarly, we will say that by means of a great sacrifice, the transformation of the world will also be possible. We know well that the axes of the earth are rising up, the day on which the poles will become the equator is not distant. The day in which the equator will become poles is not distant either. When this occurs, the seas will change their beds and will swallow the whole planet, there is no doubt that a great chaos will come. Again, at this moment the ice of the North Pole is already melting. This is originating enormous hurricanes that are devastating entire cities and causing damage, as the hurricane that recently caused many terrible things and obliterated Honduras. So, the icebergs are now moving towards the equatorial zone. No longer is the magnetic pole coinciding with the geographic pole. If at these moments an airplane takes off directly towards the North Pole, guided by a compass, and if it landed exactly on the magnetic pole, the pilots would find with astonishment that the geologic pole is no longer there, the geologic pole is rotating away, it is going towards the equator. So the magnetic pole and the geologic pole no longer coincide. This causes the climates to change, starting with certain disorders in the seasons, mainly in the spring and summer. This causes the seas to rise from their bottoms, and this powerful civilization that we have created will be destroyed. What is gravest of all of this is that with it we will also be destroyed. We will also perish. The ancestors of Anahuac said, the children of the fifth sun, talking about us, will perish by fire and earthquakes. Now this is properly determined with the catastrophe in Guatemala, that, between parentheses, was very serious, since it not only trembled, but continues trembling in that unfortunate country, and the dead are increasing. Therefore, this humanity will perish by fire and earthquakes, and finally will be definitively wiped from the face of the earth, when the oceans leave their beds. Thus, after this tremendous and frightful sacrifice, someday from the midst of chaos, new continents will arise, where a new humanity will live. Virgil, the great poet of Mantua, said, the golden age has arrived and a new progeny commands. Yes, we are so perverse that we brought about atomic wars, but the day will arrive in which a peaceful humanity will live on the face of the earth, a humanity filled with love, an innocent and pure humanity, a beautiful and wise humanity. So then, the planet Earth once emerged from the consciousness of that which is called God, from the ineffable divine, which is where we must return now. But until now, we have marched on the path of perversity, thus we will have to perish. But as Peter said in his epistle to the Romans, and to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless we, according to his promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. 2 Peter 3 verses 12 and 13 There will be new heavens and a new earth, and in them also a new humanity will live. Making reconsiderations on all of these principles, it is reasonable and worthwhile that we fight for a radical transformation. It is worth suffering the trouble to make a new man within us. We do not know ourselves, and we need to know ourselves, since within us there are wonders that we do not know. 
Somebody said to me the other day, Sir, indeed I know myself. It pleases me. I responded to him, that you know yourself, but answer the following question. How many atoms are in a single hair of your mustache? When asking him this question, he kept silent, and finally he exclaimed, that, I do not know. I said to him, if you do not even know how many atoms are in a single hair of your mustache, how do you dare to affirm with great emphasis that you know yourself in a totally integral manner? The man remained confused. Within us, there is something more than the physical body, there is a psychology that we must study. The physical body is not everything. You feel attracted towards your physicality. You know that you have a body of flesh and bones because you can touch it, because you can feel it, but scarcely can you admit that you have a psychology, because indeed it cannot be felt physically. When somebody admits that he has his own psychological, particular, individual idiosyncrasy, in fact he begins to self-observe. Obviously, when somebody self-observes, he begins to become different from others, and has possibilities for changing. A nucleus of people has to be saved from this humanity, people who will change, people who, ahead of time, will attain a psychological change. Such people will be helped and taken to a certain place in the Pacific Ocean, and thence they will contemplate the duel of the water and the fire over centuries. And finally, when new lands arise from the bottom of the oceans, those people that have changed will be able to live peacefully, they will become the nucleus of a future humanity. We need to change, and we cannot change if we do not psychologically self-observe. For that reason I said that when somebody begins to self-observe psychologically, he provides hope for change and to become a different person. We need to self-observe our thinking, feeling, and acting. It seems to me that psychological observation is not a crime. It seems to me that to attempt psychological change is not a crime. The factors of discord that produce wars in the world exist within ourselves, within our persona. In these times, much is spoken about peace, i.e. Mussolini said, peace is an olive branch on the sharp edge of 11 million bayonets. Behold his kind of words and concepts. The Italians executed him, they applied to him their famous Italian vendetta, giving him punches and kicks. Finally his corpse fell to the ground. A quite sadistic citizen, observing the corpse of Ayel Duce in the mud, exclaimed, Ayel Duce has become a pig. Peace is not a matter of propaganda, pacifications, the UN, nor pro-peace armies, etc. Remember that the UN has sent armies to fight for peace. Do you believe that fighting for peace is peace? You yourselves are witnesses of the UN armies that have attacked other armies. The UN has bombed, has taken up the rifle. Do you believe that this is how one works for peace? While the factors that produce wars continue to exist within us, there will always be wars in the world. Fear is one of the main causes for worldwide armaments. If a man fears another man, he arms himself with a weapon, a pistol at his waist. Why? Because he fears the other. If he did not fear him, he would not carry a pistol. If a nation loads itself to the teeth with weapons, if it acquires atomic bombs, ultramodern cannons, etc., it is because it fears that another nation will invade, it fears that another nation will attack. Fear is the cause for many injustices to be committed. A man kills another because of fear. Fear for one's life causes many to become thieves. Fear of hunger causes many women to prostitute themselves. Therefore, while the factors of fear, of fright, continue to exist within us, there have to be wars, prostitution, robbery, murders, etc. If we want to fight for peace, we must end the factors that produce wars. Fear is one of them. Do we want peace? Well then, we must finish with egotism, since each one of us says, first I, second me, and third, myself. If such egotism is projected worldwide, if the nations say, first I, second me, and third myself, then there always will be conflicts of interests between country and country, and war will be unleashed. Therefore, peace is not a matter of pacification, propaganda, nor of armies of peace, nor of the UN, nor of UNESCO, nor of OAS, since if the factors that produce wars continue to exist within us, there will always be wars in the world.
Peace is an ineffable atomic substance that is beyond good and evil, and that emerges from the abstract absolute space. It is necessary that we explore ourselves in these moments of worldwide crises and bankruptcy of all principles. It is necessary that we observe ourselves psychologically. At these moments in which the earth is convulsed by earthquake upon earthquake, it is necessary that we reflect upon our present situation, about what we are, about what we project, about our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Each of us here has a psychology, and this is not a matter of believing or not believing, but observation. Anger that leads us to madness exists within us. Covetousness also exists within us, and we not only covet but moreover, there are some who boast about themselves as being saints, thus they covet to not be covetous. Within us is lust that turns us into true beasts. There is also envy within us, which has become the means of social action, because if we see that someone has a pretty, ultra-modern, and flaming car, we envy him and desire to have a car like that, or even better. If we see that a friend of ours has bought a pretty house and also has a beautiful spouse, we envy our friend and desire to have a house better than our friends. And, if we want to boast about being virtuous, we affirm, no, I do not covet, I am content with what I have, bread, shelter, and refuge, and that is all, even if the desire of conquering fame, honors, prestige, money, etc., is burning within us. Pride is corroding our heart, thus each of us has our particular, individual pride. We love ourselves too much, and that is very grave. There are many sluggish gluttons, piles and piles, but we believe that we are not sluggish nor gluttonous, but holy little saints. The crude reality of the facts is that within us we have negative values that lead us to failure in these moments of worldwide crises and bankruptcy of all principles, in these precise moments in which the Third World War approaches. I say that each one of the psychological defects that we have in our interior is like a demon or a tenebrous entity. When one reads the four Gospels, we find a verse in which it is emphatically affirmed that the great Kabir, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, cast seven demons from the body of Mary Magdalene. Behold the seven capital sins. If they are multiplied by seven, and many thousands of sevens, then what the great Kabir threw from the body of Mary Magdalene was a legion. Virgil, the great poet of Mantua, said, No, not if I had a hundred mouths, a hundred tongues, and throats of brass, inspired with iron lungs, I could not half those my horrid crimes describe, nor half the punishments those crimes have met. The Aeneid, Book 6. Therefore, the Christic Gospel is correct when affirming that each of us is a legion. If we affirm in a clear and precise manner that the I is not something individual, but that it is a plurality, we would not be exaggerating. Within each person there exists the pluralized I, i.e., I envy, I love, I hate, I am afraid, I am lustful, I have egotism, etc. All of this multiplicity exists within us, here and now. We are speaking of the field of revolutionary psychology. We are affirming that within us are multiple psychological entities, and this is already properly documented. It is properly documented in all the contradictions that we have in our own mind. As soon we are affirming one thing, soon we are denying it. Our mind is like the weather. We are full of psychological acrobatics, we never keep the same opinion. Therefore, from where emerge so many psychological contradictions? The brain is nothing but the instrument of the mind. The brain is not the mind. It is made in order to elaborate thought, but it is not thought. Therefore, let us delve thoroughly, from where do so many psychological contradictions come? Obviously, they come from the plurality of the eye. If we state that each one of our eyes has the three brains, namely the intellectual, emotional, and motor brains, we would not exaggerate. In other terms, we would say, in the same manner that the three-dimensional space of Euclid exists, likewise psychological spaces exist within each person. There is no doubt that the psychological multiplicity that flourishes in us is a reality within psychological space. Nevertheless, ordinary physical senses are not capable of perceiving psychological space, but other senses can. The sense of psychological self-observation can perceive that space. Regrettably, the sense of psychological self-observation is atrophied. 
Yet, while we observe ourselves from moment to moment, we are able to develop that sense. When this occurs, the multiplicity of the I will be a reality for us, we will see it, and we will also intelligently perceive the psychological space. So, each of us is a legion, and we have our consciousness extremely asleep. The intellectual humanoid is not capable of seeing, feeling, or touching the great realities of psychological space. We need to awaken our consciousness, because our consciousness is bottled up, inserted within all of those I-S that in their whole constitute the self-willed, the myself, the itself. We need to disintegrate those I-S that personify our errors, and that is possible by means of psychological self-observation. It is in the field of practical life, i.e. in the factory, in the office, in the house, in the street, or in the market, or wherever we can discover ourselves. When in relation with people, the defects that we carry hidden spontaneously emerge, and if we are alert and vigilant as a watchman in the time of war, then we see them. Once a defect is discovered, we must severely judge it by means of the superlative analysis of the being. Any discovered defect must be studied and later disintegrated. Obviously, the mind cannot radically alter any defect. The mind can justify this or that error, change it, pass it from one department to another of our understanding, justify it or condemn it, but never disintegrate it. We need a power that is superior to the mind, a power capable of annihilating any defect. Fortunately, such a power is latent within the depth of the human anatomy. I am emphatically referring to the astral signature of fire. In a clear manner I am emphatically referring to Godmother, the principle of love, the eternal feminine divine. I am in a clear manner addressing the Divine Mother Kundalini Shakti, Stella Maris, or the Virgin of the Sea, Tenansin, Rhea, Mary, Sibylle, Adonia, Insoberta, Diana, etc. Godmother underlies in the depths of our own being. It is a flaming power that only the initiate with the sense of the psychological self-observation can perceive. Thus, if we appeal to that igneous and divine power, which is a variant of our own being, Godmother is our being but a derivative, we can then totally disintegrate any psychological defect that we had previously comprehended in all the levels of our mind. It would be enough to cry out, as when a child cries out to his mother because he is hungry or thirsty. Yes, it would be enough to beg to our Devi Kundalini Shakti for the disintegration of any previously comprehended eye defect, thus this is how it could be reduced to cosmic dust, to ashes, thus the consciousness that is bottled up within the eye defect would be liberated. By means of this procedure we could disintegrate all the I-S defects and liberate the totality of the superlative consciousness of the being. A liberated, emancipated consciousness is capable of seeing, touching, or feeling the great realities of the psychological space. A liberated consciousness is beyond the mind, and can perfectly discover the reality of all the phenomena that happen in the universe. I want you to know that there are three types of mind. We can denominate the first one as sensual mind, which develops its basic concepts via external sensory perceptions. This mind knows nothing about psychological space, it knows nothing about reality, God, etc. Mr. Immanuel Kant, the philosopher of Königsberg, wrote a book entitled Critique of Pure Reason. Kantian thought, with all its syllogisms, prosyllogisms, quasi-syllogisms, etc., is formidable. With Critique of Pure Reason, Mr. Immanuel Kant demonstrated to the world that the sensual mind cannot know anything about reality, about the truth, about God, etc., since it develops its basic concepts via external sensory perceptions. Therefore, it cannot know anything about the truth. Now, there is a second type of mind. I am referring to the intermediate mind, where all dogmas, religious beliefs, etc. are deposited. Everyone is utterly free to believe in whatever they wish, therefore, we, Gnostics, would never pronounce ourselves whatsoever against other people's beliefs. We know how to respect our neighbor's religion and all religions, because we consider that all religions are like precious pearls linked on the golden thread of divinity. Nevertheless, religious beliefs are not direct perception of the truth either. The sun exists whether we believe in it or do not believe in it. The earth will rotate around the sun whether we believe it or not. The fire will burn our finger each time that we put it within the flame, 
whether we believe it or not. Therefore, what we believe or stop believing is not the truth. Fortunately, there is a third mind, the inner mind, which is beyond the intermediate mind. If the sensual mind works based on its external sensory perceptions, then indeed, the inner mind works with the precise perceptions of the superlative and transcendental consciousness of the being. Therefore, the awakened consciousness can know the phenomena of nature in a direct, complete, integral, and unitotal manner, and thereafter transmit such data to the inner mind. Therefore, the inner mind knows about reality by means of the data transmitted by the superlative consciousness of the being. Thus, the inner mind knows about the mysteries of life and death, it knows the origin of life. It discovers what the ignorant sensual mind cannot. The inner mind knows from where we come, to where we go, and what the objective of existence is, etc. The sensual mind cannot know the phenomena of nature in themselves. I.e. we see a flower, a carnation. The sensual mind says, it is a carnation, but who told the sensual mind that this is the name of that flower? The sensual mind learned it at school, or it was taught to us at home or by other people. But, are we sure that this is the true name of this flower? This is how they taught it to us, okay, but what authority do they who put that name to this flower have? What is the true name of that flower? Are we perhaps the masters of the universal wisdom who know the name that the divine architect gave to this flower? In the inner mind, everything changes. Thus, we say, the true name of this flower is such and such, its components are such and such. At school, at college, at the university, the chemical formula of this flower was delivered to us, thus we see in this flower the formula that they placed in our memory, but we are not seeing the flower, we are not seeing its true name, we are just seeing what they taught us, we are placing on the flower what we learned at school, at college, at the university, but we are not seeing the flower. To see it is different. For this we must be open to the new, so that the flower can speak to us. If we want to know it, we must place ourselves in a receptive state. But, we are proud. We believe we are greater than the flower, thus we name it in this or that manner, and we say, this is a carnation, and its chemical formula is this, because this is how they taught us at school. But we are not seeing the flower. The consciousness can indeed see the flower and know its real name in the cosmos. The consciousness can know its true functionalism and its real elements. The consciousness can transmit that data to the inner mind, and the inner mind can comprehend it. Regrettably, at the present time with our sensual mind, the only thing that we do is to project our ideas and concepts onto phenomena. With the sensual mind, nobody can learn the phenomena of the nature and the cosmos, because life flows incessantly, and when we want to retain it, even for a moment, we kill it. Thus, only with the awakened consciousness expressed through the inner mind can we know for ourselves the phenomena in themselves, here and now. There are two types of science, profane science and pure science. In pure science, theories do not exist, only facts. I.e. if I said to you that Count Saint Germain, who lived in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, etc. centuries, is still alive, you would believe that I am crazy, but nonetheless, I know Count St. Germain, and this is why I give testimony that he is alive. He lives based on a science that you do not know. This is the pure science, the science of the Superman, a science known by the extraterrestrials who travel throughout the infinite space, the science of the lords of life and death, the science of those who have opened the inner mind. We are nothing but a part of the universal knowledge, and that is all. Yet, we can awaken our consciousness by destroying the undesirable elements that we carry within, thus transforming ourselves radically, so that we can become supermen in the most complete sense of the word. Now, at these moments of worldwide crises and bankruptcy of all principles, in these moments of terrible earthquakes and tsunamis, it is worthwhile that we explore ourselves. It is worthwhile that we try a psychological change, a radical transformation. It is worthwhile that we rise up in arms against all antiquated and extemporaneous concepts. It is worthwhile that we become true psychological revolutionaries, that we become true intelligent rebels capable of initiating a new civilization and a new culture. Chapter 2 
The Naked Truth About UFOs The following news appeared with a large headline on the front page of a very well-known newspaper in Mexico City. Flying saucers in France and United States detected by radar. Here we transcribed the text of this alarming news. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. August 2nd, AP flying saucers reappeared last night in the Midwest of the United States. The Highway Police of Oklahoma indicated that radar at the military base of Tinker, near Oklahoma City, registered the presence of four unidentified flying objects that flew at an altitude of about 7,000 meters, but the military base refused to confirm or deny the news. They hide it. On the other hand, three police patrols affirmed sighting the objects that flew in perfect formation for about 30 minutes. The color of these objects was first red, then transformed gradually into white and greenish blue. The sheriff's office in Wichita, Kansas announced that several unidentified flying objects were observed last night in the sky during some hours, at a height of some two to 3,000 meters. Marmande, France. August 2nd, APA flying saucer was seen last night by a student near the city of Marmande in southwest France. According to the witness, it was an enormous luminous disc that landed in a cultivated field and soon took off and moved away at a vertiginous speed. From all the corners of the earth arrives alarming news about unidentified flying objects. According to an eyewitness, one of those spaceships landed in France, and the crew of medium stature came from its interior. In that place, authorities found tracks of an unknown ship. In Argentina another ship landed on a mountain of difficult access. A farmer reported it to the authorities, who could observe the ship, but did not manage to reach it due to the steep landscape. In Australia, a cosmic ship flew over a control tower for space rockets at the moment in which the experts of the tower were following the trajectory of the rocket that photographed Mars. The naked truth of this matter about flying saucers is that they really exist, and that they have been registered by radar and properly photographed. It is impossible for radar and photographic devices to hallucinate. This subject matter about flying saucers is already overwhelming, and even if intellectual loafers and skeptics mock with irony those of us who affirm the existence of cosmic ships, whether they like it or not, the flying saucers are a concrete fact, properly registered by radar. We are absolutely sure that intellectual loafers do not like to face this thorny subject, due to that which is called self-love nobody likes for his self-love to be hurt, and since they love themselves too much, they are not willing to give up their beloved theories just because. Intellectual loafers think that human beings exist only on earth. Their presumption is such that they firmly believe that only they have the right to live in this wonderful and infinite cosmos. Thus, this is how they are, and there is no way to convince them that they are mistaken. Before the concrete facts, before the overwhelming news about flying saucers, the Gnostic movements remain firm, demanding that the scientists speak with frankness and stop hiding the truth about flying saucers or cosmic ships. In the desert of Nevada, United States, the great North American scientist Adamski came into contact with Venusians who landed close to the place where he was making his investigations. This widely known scientist of worldwide prestige conversed with the Venusians. In a South American country whose name we cannot mention exists a scientific society composed of 98 wise men, disciples of Marconi. These wise people coexist with a group of Martians who regularly land in that region. What bothers the intellectual loafers the most is that this subject matter does not become public, and that everything is made in secrecy. We ask the intellectual loafers if they are so unconscious as to give a stick of dynamite to a three-year-old boy. What would happen to a boy who plays with a stick of dynamite? If these flying saucers were given to earthly humanity, we can be absolutely sure that the flying saucers would be utilized for war, and nobody upon the face of the earth would be safe with their life. Let us remember the speed of these ships, their power of vertically ascending or descending, the power of apparently remain still in the air, etc. So, to give these ships to humanity would be like giving a stick of dynamite to a boy so he can play with it. Therefore, to the gentlemen intellectual loafers who are abundantly displeased with the secrecy of this matter, we advise three things. First, to regenerate themselves. 
Second, a good dose of patience. Third, to abandon the mistaken concept of considering themselves the only inhabitants of the cosmos. The rocket that photographed Mars is not a wonder of science. From their terrible photographs taken from 17,000 kilometers away, it is impossible to retrieve information about whether life can or cannot exist on Mars. It is extremely stupid to deduce the vital reality of the planet Mars based upon a terrible photograph. The innumerable craters on Mars do not signify that this planet is a dead world like the moon. If the Earth were to be photographed from a distance of 17,000 kilometers, it is logical that such a photograph would be similar to that one which was obtained from Mars. In those photographs we would see something foggy, full of innumerable craters. No cosmic photograph can inform us about the oxygen that a determined planet does or does not have. Even though the gentleman intellectual loafers feel very annoyed and send against us all their defamatory dribble, the reality is that at different places on the Earth there already exist select groups of people who are in direct contact with the inhabitants of Mars, Mercury, Venus, etc. Chapter 3 Flying Saucers and Little Green People from Lima, Peru came news dated August 2nd that stated, A flying saucer with its crew, dwarves of greenish color, was seen by a young student last night on the roof of a house of this capital, according to statements that he gave today to the Commerce newspaper. This visit is in addition to the one reported last week by a guardian of Chasaca district, about 40 kilometers from Lima who claimed to see on the patio of a factory a flying saucer protruding a tube similar to an elephant trunk, which disappeared after 10 minutes of observation. In regard to the flying saucer of last night, Alberto San Roman Nunez, of about 15 years of age, affirmed to have seen a wrinkled greenish being of about 90 centimeters in stature, 3 feet, that slid on the roof. Shortly after, the ship projected a reddish light, in the middle of which it took off and flew, leaving tracks on the ground in which for landing marks are visible. Green skin color may surprise many people, but we earthlings have races of black and yellow and red skinned people that could surprise the cosmic visitors. Indeed, not one of the eyewitnesses of flying saucers and extraterrestrial crews would dare to assert that these mysterious visitors have features that differ from those of us, the wretched earthlings. It is lamentable that science fiction has been dedicated to propagate false ideas or fantasies about the figure and form of the extraterrestrial visitors. It is clear that skin color varies according to climate, atmosphere, etc. Nevertheless, the human form, whether gigantic, medium, or small, is always the same. Science fiction has been in charge of propagating everywhere either through the radio, or through cinema or by means of television, tremendous lies that are detrimental for humanity. Defamatory calumnies against the extraterrestrial visitors have arisen, since the minds of earthlings judge in accordance with their perversities, thus wanting to see in our noble visitors all the hatred of the minds of earthlings, i.e. all the atrocities of Hitler, all the monstrosities of the inventor of the hydrogen bomb, all the bloody purges of Stalin, etc. Perverse earthlings do not want to recognize the noble intention of our extraterrestrial friends. If they wanted to take the planet Earth and to enslave all of its inhabitants, they could do it in matter of minutes, because they have sufficient elements to do it. If they wanted to destroy us, they would have already had done it, because they have atomic and scientific instruments with which they can scatter into pieces any planet in space. Let us remember that long before we earthlings knew mathematics, they were already navigating sidereal space. Our extraterrestrial friends know the planet Earth better than us, and they do not have any interest in enslaving or destroying us, as mysteriously propagated by the science fiction of these times of rock and roll and rebels without a cause. Our extraterrestrial friends know the critical hour in which we live, and only want to help us. We need their aid with extreme urgency, because we Earthlings have totally failed. If the barbarian hordes of earthlings continue with their stupid intention, that is, to capture or to destroy the cosmic ships that visit us, then lamentably we will lose the shining opportunity that our brothers from space are offering to us. They want to establish personal contact with us, but instead of welcoming them with true respect and love, instead of offering them hospitality, we send fighter jets to intercept them. Everybody wants to destroy them. Indeed, we are behaving like savages, 
very far from all type of civilization and culture. The hour has arrived to change our militant attitude and to offer our friendship and affection to our brother visitors from space, since they come to help us, not to destroy us. We, the Gnostic brothers and sisters, must begin to give the example by establishing friendly signals, circles with a point in the center, upon our properties and the roofs of our houses of our countries. Lines radiate from the central point, which go towards the periphery, from the periphery other small lines radiate that, although they do not arrive at the center, nonetheless indicate they are going towards the central point. Draw the mentioned central point of the circle and paint it with a beautiful golden color to symbolize divinity. The lines that radiate from the periphery to the central point can be blue and short, in great quantity. The lines that radiate from center towards the circle are clearly connecting the central point with the circumference, and these can also be blue. This is the symbol of divinity in Martian religion. We can use it by placing it upon the roofs of our houses, on our lands, doing it with luminous centers or simply painted, this, in order to establish friendly relations with the inhabitants of Mars and all of the inhabitants of the cosmos. Such a symbol means that everything comes from divinity and everything returns to divinity. Use this symbol in order to offer friendship to the inhabitants of space, even if intellectual loafers laugh at us. All of you already know that the intellectual loafers are 100% skeptical, even though they boast of being super-civilized. They believe themselves to be very wise when using satire and fine irony against all of us and anyone who does not want to think like them. Chapter 4 Pure Science The Lemurians of ancient times had developed objective reasoning. Likewise, many people in Atlantis possessed that type of reasoning. Obviously, the human beings from the polar and the hyperborean epochs also possessed objective reasoning. Yet, it is regrettable that in this current age of Kali Yuga very few have developed objective reasoning within their interior nature, since subjective rationalism is in fashion, it is what predominates in these times. Subjective rationalism is the basis for Kalkian personalities. Let us understand by Kalkian personalities those pseudo-esotericist, pseudo-occultist, and pseudo-scientist people from this modern epoch, along with all of their know-it-all types of foolishness. Never has there been as much darkness as there is in this epoch of Kali Yuga. In fact, only those few who have developed objective reasoning have access to pure science. Let us distinguish between the pseudoscience of this epoch of Kali Yuga and pure science. Kalkian personalities, the know-it-alls of the Tower of Babel, the studious ignoramuses of subjective rationalism, will never have access to the pure science. As an example of what pure science is, in complete opposition to the ultra-modern pseudoscience, let us observe the following examples. The scientists from the present Tower of Babel, NASA, launch rockets, shoddy scrap heaps, into outer space, propelled by volatile combustion. Thus, after performing their circus feats, they finally land their famous so-called astronauts on the moon. Behold here the outcome of the merely subjective rationalism. In opposition and as an example of pure science, there are interplanetary ships propelled by solar energy, within which liquid combustible is not necessary, ships that travel from galaxy to galaxy at velocities faster than the speed of light. The circus adventures of the famous astronauts nor anything of the sort are needed, since this belongs, as I already stated, to pure science, to objective reasoning. Looking at this, therefore, in a completely logic confrontation, we see on the side of subjective rationalism the circus-like rockets, and on the side of pure science and objective reasoning are the extraterrestrial ships. The skeptical and incredulous ones smile abundantly when we talk about extraterrestrial ships that travel from galaxy to galaxy, nonetheless, a doctor, a celebrity of NASA, was taken in one of those ships and wrote a book that is in circulation. Therefore, what we are stating here has complete confirmation. Thank you for listening.